It's not on us to make all of our decisions and live our life and figure it out. It's not on us, but it's because we are lived. Like life lives us. Thoughts show up, ideas show up. So when a bear is chasing you, your legs will run. You don't have to make the decision to run from the bear and your body will run, <laughs> like that's it. And same with decisions we make, like which job are you gonna choose and what are you gonna do with your life? That happens through us, it, ha it happens for us. It doesn't have to happen by us or from us. And that's a huge, like just a different direction in which to look that I think helps us just feel so much more at ease and kind of just be in life in a really different way. So Amy, welcome to the podcast. What's going down in your hood? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm excited to have this conversation. Me too. So it's a real pleasure. I've been a, a, a real big fan of your, particularly your books and more recently your podcast. I've been, um, you might have noticed a spike in listeners from London on your podcast. It's probably all me. <laughs> I've been listening quite a lot recently because I just found a lot of the conversations fascinating. So I'm really, uh, really excited to, to have this conversation with you today and see where we end up with it, because who knows? Great, me too. So I think the, the, the best place to start is, um, I'd love to start with your journey, because I know that you are a psychologist, or you're a doctor, I don't know if you'd still call yourself a psychologist, but you coach as well. Um, so I'd love to start with how your journey kind of went into that world to begin with and how you ended up where you are. I guess from a really early age, I always was really fascinated with like why people did the stuff they did, you know, and trying to kind of figure that out. And I always felt, you know, mostly I think initially it was driven by seeing adults around me behave really crazy. <laughs> and I remember thinking as a little kid, like, what's wrong with them? Like, why don't they just chill and enjoy life? And like, why do they always talk about money? And they're so worried all the time. And, you know, and, and, it's funny, I mean, I just remember that so clearly and being really baffled by, okay, these are the adults, these are the ones sort of guiding us, but they don't, they seem like they have it backward. Um, and then myself kind of coming to take a lot of that on as we do, you know, starting to like feeling myself go from that carefree, healthy, just happy kid in the moment to worrying the way that I saw people around me worry. And I, it, it's weird to look back at and talk about because I, I kind of like saw that happening in real time and didn't know what to do about it. Like, oh man, I'm turning up, I'm growing up like them, you know? And, and kind of always deeply knowing it doesn't have to be this way. That, that this can't be part of what everybody is supposed to go through. But it did, but it was part of everyone I ever saw. Every, every adult I ever saw kind of just lived in their head as I saw it anyway. And I was starting to do that. So, um, so as a way of kind of making sense of the people around me, figuring things out, and then, you know, trying to help myself be happy and not end up like them, I was I was reading self help books when I was like ten years old, nine and ten years wow. old, which is crazy to me because I have a ten year old now and he's into like Wings of Fire, Dragon books. I'm like I can't even imagine him hiding a Wayne Dyer book in his bed like I did. <laughs> I was reading <laughs> Wayne Dyer under the covers, and like hoping you know no one was gonna catch me. And uh, John Gray, women are from Venus and whatever you know. Like I'm hiding this stuff and sort of feeling like I need to consume this. And I was so in. I was genuinely interested in it, but I was also kind of ashamed by it because I knew this isn't normal 10 year old behavior. Um, so anyway, that, I mean, it started, it started that early. And uh, so it was no shock that I went on to study psychology and then went all the way as far as I could in my education. Um, through graduate school, I kind of really was bogged down by seeing like, wow, we're really treating people as diseased and coming from this place of what I sensed wasn't true as a little kid. Like everything I learned in my school was coming from a place of this is a disorder, this is how people get broken, and this is how you try to fix them. You help them fix their anxiety or fix their depression. And I, you know, as all of us, like we grow up and we get those messages so often that in one sense it made, it made sense, that's what we've always been told, but I never forgot that deeper sense I had as a little kid of like, wait a minute, I wasn't this until I was six or seven or eight or nine, you know, and um, so that didn't quite make sense. So. Toward the end of graduate school, I, 
I started looking more in the direction of something called coaching, which was pretty new then. This was in the early 2000s. Mm. Um, it, it was it was a thing, but it was definitely not a well-known thing like it is now. Um, and, you know, all of my academic uh, colleagues thought I was insane. Like, you're going to throw this <laughs> this research degree away, you know, to go be a coach. And who the he- what the heck even is that? But I just knew that it felt a lot more aligned. Coaches were coming at things from, you know, not from a place of people being broken quite so much. And and we didn't need to go into the past so much and all of that. So it just felt more aligned. Um, so I started doing that in, in the early 2000s and I've been doing it ever since. And it's evolved a lot over that time, but, but that's kind of how that started. Wow, I think it's amazing how, uh as such a young child you were you were so aware of like those adult people haven't got this figured out and then like that journey of like being so young and reading you know i guess what we classify as self-help books or personal development books whatever you'd want to call them um i I think that's amazing like for for such a young child to be into that and be so aware of it shows really like the the wisdom that we have when we're children of like actually i'm experiencing something very different to what they're experiencing whether we we can you put a name on it or not you know it's like that that awareness is crazy to me um and i know that you're you're like you said you started coaching in the early 2000s and the work that you do now is is uh, probably you can correct me if i'm wrong but probably very different to the type of work that you learn that you know for your for your academics so what is so different about what you do now and how did you end up you know coming across the understanding which i'm sure we'll dive into a little bit deeper in a bit yeah it's very different and it continues to be very different i mean even the coaching i did early on and even the coaching i did five years ago feels very different than today which is awesome i love that it's like we're just we're just constantly updating and seeing more and then rolling with it all of us in in any area of life um so i think yeah early on you know obviously the training was about you know here's a person with anxiety or which was which was me at one point or here's a person with an eating disorder which was me or here's a person with depression and this shouldn't be happening this is a this is kind of a glitch in this in the system this shouldn't be happening and we need to go in and try to fix that and so um even in my early coaching it kind of kind of was similar because it was all about well you want to change we're going to change that thing how are we going to do it now it didn't call you broken in quite the same way and it didn't you know treat you as diseased in quite the same way but my early coaching was a lot around changing your thoughts noticing what your conscious thoughts are which you know is helpful for sure to some degree But if you think that we're only aware of a teeny tiny little fraction of what shows up, it's kind of silly. And so in my early years of coaching, I did what we call thought work. And I mean, you literally are writing down all the painful thoughts that you're aware of and then trying to turn them around or change them or find a new thought. It's an incredible amount of work for for what you know because you caught maybe 0.001 percent of of the thought that's showing up in your head and now you're going to try to manipulate it to make it nicer it just didn't go very far now again i say that like it going from having no concept that we're thinking to seeing oh thought is driving this that's huge and that is huge for people so it was it was great for me it was great for my clients in those early days but it quickly hit a point where it's like okay this is not enough and the way i saw that as a coach and for myself was the the whole whack-a-mole thing like i would have clients come in we'd work through something you know their their feelings about their boss let's say at work they'd see that differently. And then literally the next week, they'd have basically the same gripe against their partner. And and it looked different to them. They're like, Oh, no, no, we figured out the thing with my boss. But now my partner is doing this other thing. And I and from an outside perspective, you know, when you're in it, it does look different. From an outside perspective, I'm like, don't you see this is the exact same thing. It's just the storyline is slightly changed. So I started to get on to the fact, you know, like, okay, no, there's a deeper place to look and we're only at the surface here. Um, And so rather than kind of like it's sort of evolved from uh, 
paying a lot of attention to the content of our thinking, what we're thinking, trying to change or manipulate that to simply seeing that thought is bringing everything to life. And even that we can see in like just infinitely deep ways. You can sort of see that, which is helpful, or you can like deeply see that, which is completely life-changing and everything in between. And we're all seeing that in different ways all the time. So, so that's probably the, I don't know, maybe the thing to point that's easiest to kind of point to that has evolved so much going from kind of, oh, let's make you a person with nicer self-esteem because you think nicer thoughts to, oh no, do you see that this thing we call self-esteem is literally all thought and all thought just comes and goes and changes on its own. Why are we trying to nail it down and manipulate it? Yeah, I love that. I, I heard this uh, um, description of, of what self-esteem means, like the etymology of it. And self-esteem is, is short for self-estimation which when you break down the words, it's like the story you tell yourself about yourself. And that was like, wow, I heard it at some point uh, about 18 months ago, maybe a year ago. And I was like, wow. So when we talk about self-esteem, like, oh, my self-esteem is low. It's like the story I'm telling myself about myself today is one of low value. And I was like, whoa, that changes so much. Um, I love that. I love that you brought that up because it just reminded me of that. It was like a real big, I see this like, everything's so different now because of the way that I uh, relate to myself based on the story that I'm telling myself in any given moment you know it changes quite a lot and very similar to you like the the following this journey and, and this understanding deeper and deeper has helped me to to rid myself of a lot of anxiety depression and things like that so I'd love to hear more of uh, your experience with that I know you mentioned anxiety depression binge eating what what was it particularly that that shifted for you to 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 almost relieve yourself of those labels in a way yeah i mean i don't know and i don't think we ever know like i can i can tell you some things and i will <laughs> but i just want to preface that by saying like you know we we think we know what it is and we're, we're it's our best estimation, right? Just yeah, kind of like yeah. self-esteem. Like I can tell you a story that makes sense and I think there's some accuracy to it, but truly I don't know for myself or anyone I work with how this stuff actually works and what creates what shift. But, you know, I think, um, again, kind of mirroring how my work with people changed, my way of viewing myself which I think is just a thought and a concept too, but the way like there, it used to look like there was this absolute real solid Amy character who had a lot of shortcomings. And if she wanted to be happy in life, she like, there was just no doubt about it. You could put a happy face on it, but she still had these shortcomings and they were true shortcomings. Like no one would argue with that in my story. Right. So, and I could, I could be, I could work on kind of being at a little more peace with them or whatever, but but if I wanted the best shot at happiness, I needed to just work my butt off and make these things better, make them go away. Mm. So that's a really hard way to live and it's how most of us view life and view ourselves and our issues, you know? So from that way of seeing things, it was like, okay, I have this anxiety problem. I need to get stronger, think differently, do differently. And I, you know, went to all the therapy and did all the things. And, and in the course of that, I definitely had some insight and saw that my thoughts are safe. My feelings are safe. Um, they don't mean what my mind was telling me they meant. So over time, there was a real softening of, of there being a solid me with anxiety to, oh no, this is just experience that's arising. And, it, and it's not, it's not inherently horrible it's just what is and same with any issue same with my eating disorder it looked like this was a problem and i need to get all these things right and get the diet right and get the thoughts right and the feelings right and all of this and and over time just by sort of exploring this kind of stuff we're talking about it started to look like okay nothing is solid here there's no me with an eating disorder because as much as I was in the throes of an eating disorder, there were a lot of times when I wasn't. I also went to work and held a job and got married and like li there was life without an eating disorder. So how could I say there was this me that had this issue, you know? 
And and even with the thoughts and feelings, I, I would have said, oh, this triggers me. Every time this happens, I get triggered or whatever. And yeah, looking back, it sure as heck looked that way. But there were times when it didn't. Or there were times when it triggered me like that. And then there were times where I just sort of felt it. And so it's almost like rather than everything looking so separate and solid, what started to happen over time is things kind of all started to flow together and look a lot more fluid. And I started to not know, which was beautiful. I started to say, I don't know. I don't know who I am, if I even am. I don't know how I'm supposed to be. I don't know what feelings are right and wrong. I don't know the right and wrong way to eat. And that was giant. It's huge. It's huge for the people I work with because, again, it starts to just soften all of these hard, rigid concepts. And then we just start to flow with life in a way that that ends up being a lot better for us. Mm, I love I love that. I don't know. And the, the thing that I get from that and I'm going to speak on behalf of the listener here. So anyone who's listening, please don't judge me if this sounds ridiculous to you. But that idea of I don't know how to be, I don't know uh, what's the right or wrong feeling, I don't know what's the right or wrong way to eat, sounds quite scary. It's like, <gasps> you know, I don't know. It's like I should know. Um, so I'd love to hear like why that was so freeing for you because I know I've been there myself is like when you start stepping into the idea of I don't know it feels very scary but there's a lot of comfort that comes within it so I'd love to hear like your your experience of that and why that kind of uh from what I'm hearing freed you up so much yeah I love that question because you're right it's it feels terrifying to a person who's conditioned as we all are every single one of us conditioned to view ourselves as separate from life person who's in charge of things like you better get this right or else or else you're not going to be happy or else you could die i mean there's so many that this is just this is just even it's not even just conditioning from society it's literally how our brain works our, we have a brain that is survival focused around this body our brain doesn't care about our happiness it doesn't care that we have a variety of experiences or that we are self-actualized or any of that your brain is just here to keep this body alive so to keep this body alive it is it is very strict and it kind of feels like it needs to know everything <laughs> and it you know and everything is a potential thread and it's just kind of it's a, the brain's a little anxious <laughs> because it just has a big job to do to keep this body alive so um so for all of us which is all of us who have grown up like just come into life feeling like I'm a me and this is all on me it's terrifying it can be really terrifying uh to kind of feel like, wait a minute, well, I don't know. And I don't know how I'll ever know. And at the same time, it's a massive relief and it can start to feel really, really freeing because as much as we've all tried to know everything and manage our way through life, every one of us has so many experiences of that not working. So I think that's where the relief comes in. It did for me where I was like, oh my God. So, so I, I don't need to figure this out there's no answer to how I should eat and how I should feel and what I should do and what my purpose is. There's no real answer to those questions. That's amazing. Like that's good news because I had tried for 30 some years to find the answer and never did. And everybody listening has tried for however old you are, you know, to find those answers. And we, we deeply know it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think what's so beautiful about this is seeing like it is not on us to to answer the questions our mind throws out it's not on us to make all of our decisions and live our life and figure it out and it's not on us and, and that can that feels terrifying until we see well it's not on us but that's because we are lived like life lives us thoughts show up ideas show up when something is you know when a bear is chasing you your legs will run you don't have to make the decision to run from the bear you are going to run your body will run <laughs> like that's it you hold your breath for long enough because you're you're trying to bet with your friend who can hold your breath longer your lungs will breathe when it has been long enough like you don't have to decide that there are so many and same with decisions we make like which job are you going to choose and what are you going to do with your life 
that happens through us. It, ha it happens for us. It doesn't have to happen by us or from us. And that's a huge, like just a different direction in which to look that I think helps us, like we were saying, just feel so much more at ease and fluid and kind of just be in life in a really different way. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of when I first got onto my journey, I started doing all of the stuff, you know, reading the books, listening to the podcast, doing the exercise, doing the meditation, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that I, I very like rarely rem like think about, but I vividly remember it is one day I was meditating and a thought, you know, when you, when you meditate or sometimes I even have this in the shower, like random thoughts just come out of nowhere about like dinner that I had last week or like the, the snail that I nearly stepped on two days ago or what could be happening at that party that I'm attending on the weekend or, or whatever. And I remember sitting there in this meditation and this random thought, I can't remember the thought, but I just remember thinking like, where did that come from? Where? Like it just came from nowhere. And then all of a sudden it was like the next thought. And I was like, where did that come from? Nowhere. I was like, and where did that come from? Nowhere. And then it like disappeared. And I was like, how did it leave? I didn't do anything and it just left. And it was like this amazing like moment of like recognizing that these thoughts that we have are just they're li they're, uh, they're kind of living through us momentarily. They come from nowhere and they leave when we don't do anything about them. But what I started to recognize in that moment was my journey for a lot of my life had been, oh, here's a thought. Oh, that thought's come from somewhere. Let me grab onto it and let me like inspect it a little bit and see what it means about me. But when I started to, to, to be in that place of almost like observing the thoughts, I realized that actually there's so much random junk that's coming through me right now <laughs> in any moment. It could be the most random thing or something that seems like it needs attention. And when I started to kind of leave the thoughts alone and recognize that 99% of the time we don't have to do anything with a thought that we have, everything just started to free up. It's like you said, you know, if there was a bear that, you know, burst through this window, okay, if the thought was there's a bear right there, maybe we should get up and run. I probably might do something about that thought. <laughs> But more often than not, it's like we don't. There's nothing to be done, and that really freed me. And um, I started to to, I wouldn't say instantaneously because that I would be lying. But over time, started to free myself from a lot of anxiety. Started to free myself from a lot of the uh, depressive uh, states that I found myself in, and that that really vividly sticks out to me because it's like, the thoughts come from nowhere. I didn't I didn't have control over that thought coming into my mind it just appeared and that was really like freeing and wild at the same time but freeing you you know yeah and and I think what you said about it not meaning well you, I don't know if you said this but you would add like what does this mean about me and you know like to see that is giant that's so huge because of course we assume or our mind assumes everything that shows up is about us. And again, I'd love to just talk about the brain, the way that the brain works in this regard, because it kind of starts to clearly show, yeah, this is just a machine. It's just an organ. And that's just how that organ works. I mean, literally its whole job is to keep this body alive. And so it just revolves everything around you, this idea of a you. So a thought, a random thought might pop in. Of course, our mind is gonna say, why did I think this? And what does this have to do with me? But to have that experience where you're like, wait a minute, I didn't think it. I'm sitting here mm. meditating. I have no clue where that came from. And what if it doesn't mean anything about me? That's huge for people too, because all that focus on this me and my life that holds everything together starts to loosen. And, you know, I mean, that's where so much of our suffering comes in, it, it, whether it's depression or anxiety or anything. It's like when everything revolves back to this me and it all means something about me, it's such a hard way to live. The way you describe it feels so freeing when it's like we're almost just in like in this amazing adventure, like, ooh, what's going to sh show up next? Mm. I have no clue and, and I don't have to do anything about it then it's like life gets so much easier yeah and 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 also like i don't have to care either you know because it's sometimes it's the caring that i guess ties into the 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 me or the i or the self you know that that the brain has uh created 
Um, and I'd, lo- I'd love actually to, th- I love, this is one of my favorite topics to dive into. So let, let's, let's hit it. Um, th- this idea of self, the you, the I that, that I refer to when I say I or me or self or whatever, that to me feels like the, I don't want to say the root cause of a lot of the suffering, but buying into, like you said, the thinking being about that self is what creates to me suffering, um, especially in my experience anyway. So I'd love to hear your um, reasoning behind what the self is and why we do or potentially don't need it. Well, I, I think it's just a thought. I think like you said, it's just, it's just a thought that a mind uses to organize everything else that's coming in to kind of tell a coherent story. So we know from a lot of brain research that, that our brain loves coherence. It will make things up. It'll completely fabricate things just in service of telling a story that makes sense. So you can, you know, you can, there's so many different fun, like cool experiments about this, but they give people completely, uh, completely incomplete, completely incomplete information and our mind will fill in the blanks. It'll make things up and it'll say, oh, well, this is why I chose this because, you know, like the pantyhose study is a famous one. They have the exact same pairs of pantyhose and they, and they say, well, which one do you like better? And people say, I like this one better. And they'll say, why? If, if we're asked a why question, our mind is going to give an explanation and it's going to make sense. Oh, because they're thicker. Oh, because I like the texture better. Meanwhile, they're the exact same as the other ones. So it's like our brain makes crap up all the time just just to have a coherent story. And because our brain is so focused on keeping this physical body alive, its whole universe revolves around this, which ends up being called me. (laughs) So it's like every thought that arises every feeling, every craving, every preference, every opinion, that all has some reference point that the brain, just for the brain to organize all that information. And the reference point is Alex or Amy. These are Amy's opinions. These are Alex's preferences. So the whole thing is a thought. It's like this whole idea of an Alex or an Amy is just a thought. Now, of course, it, be- it gets associated with the body and other people call us that. And then we just completely, you know, don't live in the reality of that at all. We live as if we're a separate me and I'm a real thing. But just from that brain perspective, yeah, I think it's just something that organizes information. And it's great in that regard. I mean, it's everything the brain does is amazing. Everything. It, it it's always looking out for our survival but it's double great to kind of see that this is what a brain makes up and we get to be on to it a little bit we get to see yeah i can live as if i'm a separate me and relate to people and have coherent stories and i also can know that the stories are stories Mm. you know that's where it gets really good yeah i love that and it's it's i don't know if you noticed when we were exchanging emails but i started to sign my emails off with like alex in like inverted commas because it's like a nice reminder for me that like alex and who i think i am is entirely made up you know i think you, you used the word a concept earlier and it's like seeing it as this conceptual uh structure in a way that sort of psychological structure shall we say that that i have created this story about who i believe i am to be in the world i'm someone who likes football i'm someone who likes watermelon i'm someone who doesn't like you know really hot days in london when i'm sweating and recording the podcast you know I, you know or whatever it's like we it's all it's all made up by the idea of who we think we are and um, I, I got this T-shirt on, it says zero plus. And uh, it's, a, it's a concept that me and my friend Sachin came up with. And it's like the zero to, to, to me is like the the nothingness that we were mentioning earlier that, that our thoughts come from, which is also us. Like we, we're also that nothingness. And then the plus is like, in this instance, is the idea of who I think I am, because that is an additional optional thing that I have put on top of or into the zero and um like i just like to have fun with it in little ways like the email thing's quite fun to sign off with like the inverted commas alex uh, as a nice reminder for myself and i'd love to i'd love to know more about um i know you've written about like the who you are beyond the kind of identity of self 
Um, so what what role does does that play in this whole, I guess, equation in a way? Yeah, I mean, that's the part that um, like the zero <laughs> of your zero plus the plus is easy to talk about, you know, the zero is not so easy to talk about. And in fact, it's like, that's the kind of thing that's like the minute you're talking about it, you're not really describing it because now you're just using more concepts to try to point yeah. to it. Um, and and I think it's nice to know that we can talk about the plus and we can see that like that the brain does this and these stories aren't the truth they're just it's you know we can kind of and we can look at the identities and kind of question those a little bit and that has this way in my experience of like once we start to crumble that a little bit poke some holes in that it like opens each of us to our own zero whatever that is and so we get to have a felt experience of that zero just by having the plus start to crumble yeah that makes sense because yeah. i don't i just find it really hard to talk about the zero like you know again we can use more words and say like a word the awareness where we're just like i tend to call it energy like it's all energy it's formless whatever um but it's just so tough <laughs> to really yeah to kind of point to anything there but we can know we can know more easily what we're not and yeah. and again i always kind of go back to i don't know too i think it's so powerful to be in this place of i don't know like like there's a field beyond all the concepts and right and wrong i don't know how to describe that or what it is but I sense that it's there. I think we all sense that it's there. Yeah, and I lo I love the idea that the 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 zero is shared amongst all of us. It's it's all the same zero, you know. It's not my zero is not a different one. It's like it's shared, and I guess the I love actually in in being human. I think it's in the introduction chapter. You write about just understanding the way that the mind works. It's like what I'm hearing and what you say. It's just we don't need to know the details of the zero or be able to describe it or know exactly what it is it's like but just understanding what it is or that it's there is all it's all we need and we can kind of rest in that rest in the understanding that the zero is the kind of formless foundation for everything that we see and experience and then the plus or the you know the self or the whatever you want to you want to call it is the the additional stuff that's interchangeable you know, and it, and it's not like oh one's better than the other either is as well. I want to clarify that it's like they they just they are kind of the same thing. They work intertwined with each other, and it's like again we don't need to do anything about that information. We can just leave it there. But understanding it is like the key for me. You know, it's just rest in the understanding. Yeah, and as soon as we're in knowledge and kind of um, thinking we know something, that's in the plus. So it's mm. like the zero is unknown, unknowable, and it doesn't need knowing or care about knowing. You know, it's just every, it's just it's just infinity. It, it, like there's nothing that can't even be known there. So that's interesting too. But I, I think it's so important what you said about because right away a mind's gonna pit one against the other. Like oh, zero is good and plus is bad, and not at all. They're one and the same. They're not separate, right? They're one and the same. But in a set, the way I think of it is, it's like it's like from that zero essence anything and everything can manifest as an apparent plus as an apparent thing but it at its essence it's still zero so it's mm. still just energy or love or whatever people love to call it like to call it god whatever zero it's still just that appearing as a pen or appearing as a microphone and all things that appear are temporary so an Amy, an Alex, a pen, a microphone, these things are temporary. They aren't real. They aren't, there's nothing really to them. But the essence is not temporary. The essence is everything. So yeah. there's something in that that I love, like just that sense of like from the zero, everything shows up and then it just poof goes back to zero. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just so funny. I had this picture in my mind as you were saying that of like being on a boat and trying to understand how if you know if you're on like a big cruise ship for example like being on the cruise ship out at sea and trying to understand how this big heavy thing is floating in the water like you drive yourself crazy trying to figure it out and trying to understand the dynamics and looking into the physics and 
all of this and it's like actually you don't need to know it's just it's doing what it does it's it's working and it's floating and the sea is there to you know i don't know whatever hold the boat for example and it's like i don't know they, they just that picture just came to my mind of like we can run ourselves crazy trying to figure out why and how and you know do i need to know the answer to this and it's like actually if you're on a boat and you just rest in the understanding that the physics work <laughs> you don't have to worry about it then you, you probably enjoy the the ride a lot more great example because it shows like i got anxious just going there with you in the example of like i've been on many cruise ships and if i was sitting there like how is this working i mean you'd be a mess yeah. but when it's just not even on your mind it just is what it is and then yes it frees you up to see so much so yeah, yeah. i think that's so big and it really highlights how we tend to a mind is so focused on a me and keeping a me safe that it's going to be scanning for like is this good for me or bad for me or what do i need or what should i pay attention to and you start to see where all this heaviness and anxiety and depression and habits and all of that comes from yeah for sure um i love i love the way that you describe it as energy and um i've just finished reading just the thought and there's an amazing passage on, this is how well I know it, on page 78. <laughs> I've read it to so many people. Um, and it's the the way that you describe uh, the formless energy that, that, that passes through us and we experience and how it's unbiased and it's completely um, neutral. And then we add a subjective story to it, which then becomes our experience. So um, I'm not going to ask you to reread the passage or like, re, you know, off the top of your head but like um can you explain a little bit about that uh how that dynamic works as well and that that felt experience of the energy yeah i think you tell me if this is sounds like what you're the part you're talking about but it's like i always used to picture like a filter almost it's like there's this this infinite formless energy that is everything and then it gets kind of, this is not accurate, this is just a metaphor, but it's like, it feels like it kind of gets filtered through a brain in a sense. And we have the, we have this mind that, that remembers, so, you know, again, it's just all survival based. So it remembers things it thinks it needs to remember and it has stored knowledge and all of this. And it's like when that formless, energy gets filtered through this little brain which has all kinds of stuff you know crowding it it gets spit out the energy gets spit out in a super subjective way it gets spit out like and again there's so much research on this but we just all know anecdotally i mean you can be in a good mood and see something and just have a totally different experience of it than if you're in a bad mood or if i see someone who looks like my fourth grade teacher I'm way more likely to like that person than you might be if that person has no recognition for you, you know, just little things like that that are beyond our even awareness. But it kind of what, what I think is so cool about this is it really highlights how we live in the feeling of this subjective pool of stuff. You know, it's like there's this infinite energy that is everything. It's 99.9%, .9%, let's say. And then there's this little 0.1% that gets spit out at the end. That's like Alex's version of this based on all your memories and all your traumas and all your preferences. And then we just hang out in that as if it means mm, something yeah. about life. <laughs> you know, like that doesn't mean anything about life. It's not true. It's not the truth. It's, not, it's, just, it's just how it got spit out through you or spit out through me. Mm, yeah i love that and uh i think the if, if i'm re recalling co correctly the the story in that passage of the book is is about uh, tony robbins and bruce springsteen and it's like uh bruce says to tony that like before a performance his stomach's in knots and he feels like his heart rate's up and he's feeling nauseous and it's like most people would interpret that as like stage fright or nervousness or like you know something in that realm but like to 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 Bruce Springsteen it's like he's excited he knows he's pumped he's going to give like an amazing show and it's like that that energy is being experienced through the filter of Bruce as excitement or I'm pumped whereas someone else it would come through their filter but uh, and be oh I'm, I'm nervous or I don't want to speak on stage or whatever and I've been there I've had I've had similar experiences where it's like you feel the same kind of energy in a 
but you feel it in a different way based on the filter that has come through in your own little brain. And it's uh, it's like football. I, like, I'm a massive sports fan, so like football or s- soccer, as you may call it, is a, a really good example of this because you watch two teams play against each other. One team wins and half of the people watching are very, very happy and the other half of the people are very, very upset or annoyed or angry. And it's like they witnessed the same thing but the filter in which they've, they've they've experienced it through is like one is like this is bad because my team lost and the other one's like this is good because my team won but it's like you've experienced the same thing and probably the same energy and the same feelings without the labels like the, the energetic feeling and then we've added the label of like good bad happy sad annoyed i don't know pumped or whatever you would say you know i feel that a lot I notice that a lot my my son is a big soccer player uh in in my husband gets very into it and me not so much. I'm just like, oh, go kid, try your hardest. Let's all have fun, you know? And like, that's not how most of the parents are like a little more into it than I am. Uh, And even in just what happens, like I feel like I'll see, I'm not saying like I'm super unbiased or anything, but compared to people who are more into it, like, like, like one kid will kind of be a little rough and shove, you know, somebody else. And all the parents would be like, oh, ref, call that, you know, and like they see it as this big aggressive thing. But then when it happens on the flip side, when it's one of our boys being a little rough, no one says a word, you know, except the other side. And it's like, sometimes you notice that like, wow, look at all the, look at how this comes out so different. But what you were saying, I think this is so huge about, um, this is kind of where this organizing thought of a me and a me with a past and in as soon as there's a past there's also a future there's like a past and based on our past there are these things that are likely to happen in the future not really but just in our how our mind spits it out to us what you mentioned about um or made me think of it about how a beating heart and all that will show up i mean i see this a lot in the people i work with um, where if somebody's had had uh, depressive episodes in the past, understandably, they feel a little sad, and right away their mind is like, "Oh my gosh, is it depression again? This is the same time last year when it happened. This is the same feelings I had last year," and you can feel how that's just a mind clinging to this idea of this person, like me, as you know, prone to depression, and then just matching and trying to match everything up and make a prediction. And it's, it's a miracle how smart our mind is with all that, but it's huge when you see us getting so caught up in it. And, and it's all based on thought that's not even accurate. You know, it's very subjective and that has nothing to do with the future. So, and for me, it's like when I was in my eating disorder and with people with habits, you know, if I would feel a little hungry, it's like alarm bells go off. A typical person, you feel hungry, you go eat. No big deal, right? But for other people, it just means something so different. So I think in those things, when we're talking about depression and habits and anxiety and all of that, I mean, this, what we're saying is so practical and so necessary for people to, or helpful for people to have a little sense of. Like, no, this is literally your brain taking all this information and just trying to spit it into a predictive model of what might happen. Mm -hmm. And when we don't know, when we take that really seriously, we don't know any better, we get really caught up in that. And then we do end up feeling really depressed just because of a thought that showed up. Yeah. It's, oh, do you know what? You've just sparked another great analogy. Um, when you said that it pre- it's just trying to predict the future, it reminded me of like predictive text. When you, you know, if you type like how are, automatically your phone is going to, based on what you've written before, is going to suggest you. But you might be like, how are the tomatoes in the garden? Or how are, you know, X, Y, and Z? And it's like our brain has kind of got its own uh, algorithm in a way and it tries to figure things out based on the algorithm that it's learned because of past experience or whatever it is. And it's like seeing our mind playing that role for us with the thoughts that pass through us and the experience that we have is quite interesting. Um, and it actually reminds me, I wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, is um, in in being human, there's a couple of chapters which I've sent to people who I work with that have been very helpful for them, which is where you talk about how we can change the past. Um, so I'd love to hear just a little bit on on that and how in your experience that is something that can be possible for people because we've all, you know, you with your, your binge eating, me with my depression and anxiety and other stuff, it's like those things 
were very real ex um, experiences at the time. And it's like, how, how do I change that? You know, can I change that? Yeah, I mean, and I would probably say that a little differently now because I wrote that book like eight years ago. But, but the but the point is the same. Like you say, we feel so like no, this is the past. This is what happened. And I remember having that insight when I was writing that of like, oh my gosh, even something, even the same events, the same facts, everything. Truly, like there is no past. There there is no past. It's only thought in this moment. So when thinking in this moment shifts and changes, the past can be 100% different. And when the past looks 100% different, the future is likely to look, and there's no future either, but the made up future that our mind is talking about is likely to look very, very different. So yeah, I mean, that's what I think is just so amazing about insight and just holding holding our thoughts and our all of our experience very loosely because we can, look back and say this thing happened and it was horrible and I wish it hadn't happened. And at the exact same time, you don't need to do anything with that, but you can know, okay, this is the creative, the creative license that my mind is taking at this moment. My mind is creating that experience right now, not in the past, right now. And it's just creative. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no solidity to it. There's no accuracy to it. it. It has to be just a creative process. And, you know, I've seen it a lot. I'm sure we all have just in our everyday life, but in my, in our work as coaches, we see it a lot too, where people have such resentment against someone. And then maybe one new little thought comes in or one little conversation comes in and it can just completely blow it up. Or I've seen with a lot of people where they have all this resentment against their parent, let's say, and then that parent dies. And suddenly, as soon as that parent is no longer there, they're just flooded with gratitude and they're flooded with all the happy stuff. And it's like, what? happened nothing you didn't resolve anything you didn't go to therapy with them like thought shifted that's it yeah i love that thought shifted yeah amazing and it's like the way i see it is that we we you know going back to what we were saying earlier is we can change the estimation the story um that we've been telling ourselves about the past and what it means to the me that is uh you know created you know and I think that's that's really freeing in itself is seeing like actually it's not a fixed story. It doesn't have to be a fixed story. It doesn't it doesn't even have to be a story. It's just a point of reference. Like, okay, yeah, yesterday I was at the shop, today, right now I'm not. It doesn't need to mean anything about me. Um so if we if we can see it without and I, it sounds a bit strange to say it, but if we can see it without the meaning that we've placed on it, it just becomes a point of reference that we're now free from the the weight, the heft of the story, you know, and um, that we've kind of like placed on it, which I think for me has been very freeing a hundred percent. It's changed a lot for me and it's really opened my eyes to just living a more fulfilling, beautiful life, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. How, how long have you been on this journey of seeing things in this way? Ooh, how long have you got? <laughs> um, so I, I started my journey in, in like the self development and personal development work growth whatever you want to call it about 10 years ago so when I was 25 and it was when I was depressed and I had a breakdown in front of my ex and it was the moment where I realized like I want to change something here and then I got into all the stuff I said before the meditation the podcast the books and a few years later um, after like a year and a half actually two years I started to notice that things had changed my perspective was looking a bit more positive and I was starting to be excited about life again and then another couple I'm trying to nudge the story along another couple of years went by and then I was starting to see that a lot was changing for me and that's when I started my podcast in 2017 um, and around the same time, I started to hear more about coaching and stuff like that, um, like through the books where I was reading and the podcast I was listening to. And I remembered there was a guy called John Dashfield who I did some work with many years before that in 2010. We, we created an app together with, with the company I was working for. And he was a coach and he was the only person in the whole entire world who I actually knew who was this thing called a coach. And I reached out to him for a conversation to hear more about it because I was really intrigued and curious. And we met up for lunch and he just pointed me in the direction of, um, okay, if you want to get into coaching and you want to understand about business, go and check out Steve Chandler and his work. And if you want to, you know, get into the depths of like, the, he called it the uh, the forefront of psychology, 
go and check out this guy called Sydney Banks and the free principles. And that was back end of 2017. And straight away, like things were changing. Like I, I wrote my own book in 20, well, I pieced it together in 2020, but I wrote it over a number of years called The Search for Clarity. And it's like the understanding we're talking about is interwoven into it a little bit through my journey. Um, I would say that I probably wasn't seeing it as <laughs> deeply as I see it now. Um, and have a, uh, I'm not, I don't say I have a great understanding of it at all, because I know I don't, but it's not as, as deep as it is now then. But um, it, I can see when I look back, I read the book again recently, that it was already starting to change things for me. Um, and that was like, yeah, like I said, what's that coming up to five years now? Be five years around October time, November time. It's so awesome how we just kind of get pointed in a direction and then just your curiosity or your struggle or who knows what pulls you forward. Even that, it's kind of how we started this conversation where it's like when these random thoughts show up, we don't even have to figure out which ones I should pay attention to and which ones I should act on. Like life does that for us. Life lives us in that way. So we'll have a struggle or an issue or just a curiosity or a preference or an obsession and we'll naturally follow it and then and then this just kind of keeps deepening and deepening it's just it's so fun i mean we're just we're both all of us are just so brand new at this really in the big picture and that's awesome i know i could i could have these conversations all day um but unfortunately we have to stop them at some point otherwise every podcast would be about six hours long <laughs> and i'm not trying to be like joe rogan <laughs> um but yeah amy i want to thank you so much for for sharing so much of your experience and wisdom um, and for taking the time out for joining us on this episode um, so I'd love to, um, for you to share with the listeners where they can find out more about the work that you do, if there's any particular of your books that you want to shout out or any social feeds that you want to shout out, then please, uh, now's your time to, to shout it all out. Thank you. Um, the best place to find out everything I'm up to is on my website, which is dramyjohnson.com. Um, I, my flagship course is called The Little School of Big Change. It's where I help people see this understanding, especially with regard to habits and anxiety. Um, and that course is starting in mid-September, so there's one coming up soon. And then I also train coaches in my change coach training who want to go on and, and support people from this understanding. So that's coming up as well. But dramyjohnson.com is probably the easiest place to go for everything. Amazing. Thank you. And I'd, I'd highly recommend anyone who's in, really enjoyed this conversation and wants to hear more of this, go and check out Amy's podcast, the Changeable Podcast. It's full of incredible uh, conversations, solo episodes, Ask Amy episodes, guests. Um, so yeah, go, go and check that out. And uh, yeah, thanks for spending the time with us today. Thank you, Alex. Thanks a lot.